Hello, this is Dr. Amy Toon, and I'm going to be recording how to do a assessment of the chest and lungs. The chest and lungs allow for the respirations, and the purpose of the respirations is to keep the body adequately supplied of oxygen and to excel or ex expel the um, carbon dioxide. The respiration is the movement of the air back and forth from the alveoli to the outside environment. Gas exchange across the alveolar pulmonary capillary membranes and, um, and it expels the carbon dioxide from the peripheral tissues. When you look at this slide, it's going to show you, um, oops, it's going to show you where the lobes are on the anterior and posterior chest. And you're going to see that the right middle lobe is best heard from the right side and right lateral side. As you auscultate, be sure and remember what's underneath and you realize particularly where the trachea is and, um, and keep your um, scapula to where you know <clears throat> And you can keep your bony landmarks in mind as you listen underneath the skin. Realize the heart is going to displace the... There's only going to be two lobes on the left side because of the heart and three on the right. And note where the diaphragm is. Because you're going to be measuring the diaphragmatic excursion and expansion in this exam. Realize that the, the right bronchi is more downward and the left is more angular. And this is one of the main reasons why if there's an aspiration, it's more likely to get lodged in the right bronchi just because of the angle of it and it is larger. This is just to remind you of um, where you're going to find the bony structures and approximately where the diaphragm is as you measure that on the anterior and posterior back. So, let's review. Um, you're going to start off inspecting the chest, the front and the back, and noting thoracic landmarks. You're going to look for the size and the shape of the chest, uh, symmetry, color, any kind of superficial venous patterns, and the prominence of the ribs, particularly for your diaphragm. And you're going to evaluate the respirations for the rate and the rhythm and the pattern, and inspect the chest movements for symmetry, if it's symmetrical to, in, in the use of a, a accessory muscles and um, any audible sounds with respirations will also be noted. Here's the normal breath sounds that you would have. They're regular and comfortable. They're 12 to 20 a minute. And if your respirations are decreased, it's bradyapnea. And um, you've got all your respirations here. Um, and if you're hyperventilating, sighing, um, all the way to chain stokes. How about the chest for the following? <laughs> um, you're going to, after you inspect, you're going to palpate and you're going to look for symmetry, thoracic expansion, sensation such as crepitus or any kind of grating vibrations and tactile frimitus. So, for tactile frenitis, when you palpate, there's two methods to do this. You can do it with the palmer side of your hands that are going to be on both sides, and you're going to want to feel vibrations. The normal is to feel symmetrical vibrations that are equal in intensity. You can also try it on the side of your hand by your fifth finger, and um, see if you're able to feel any kind of vibrations, which in the 
point of doing it as in example B is you're over nothing but lung tissue at that point and ribs. The scapula is out of your way. The physical exam, um, you're going to do a direct or an indirect percussion of the chest comparing sides for the following and you're going to do a diaphragmatic excursion, um, a percussion tone intensity, pitch, and duration. So on the diaphragmatic um, expansion, you're going to put your hands like they are here and when they take a deep breath, both hands should should move upward and come back to where your thumbs touch again. The normal of the, the diaphragmatic expansion is going to be um, that both hands move symmetrically. You're also going to auscultate the chest with the stethoscope diaphragm from the top of the apex to the basis comparing side to side. Looking at intensity, pitch, duration, and quality of breath sounds. The unexpected breath sounds would be crackles, they used to be called rails, ronchi, wheezing, and friction rubs. And you're going to also auscultate for vocal resonance by having the patient say a couple of things, 99 or ah, uh, and see if it comes out clear as an A or if it comes out more like um, an E. Okay. And when you're auscultating for A and E, that's called egophony, and it should be the same as what they're saying. It's, it only changes if there's some, something going on in the lungs. The chest, um, is bone and cartilage and muscle and these are the bones, the sternum, manubrium, the xiphoid process which is movable in kids and 12 pairs of ribs um, that are connected by the inner um, coastal cart or the coastal cartridges cartilages. The primary muscles for respirations are going to be the diaphragm and it contracts during inspiration and it expands during expiration. Um, the external intercostal muscles and they increase the chest diameter during the inspirations. And the primary muscles of respiration are the anterior intercostal muscles that decrease the transverse chest diameter during expirations and the sternocleidomastoid and trapezius are your accessory muscles and they're brought into play only when there's pulmonary problems or some kind of compromise. The chest interior is divided into three spaces, the mediastinum um, and it is situated between the lungs and it contains all the thoracic um, versa except the lungs the right and the left pleural cavities, and it's lined with parental or visceral pleurae. And the lungs are enclosed by serous membrane. Realize that the lungs are highly elastic and um, they're paired but not symmetric. The right lung's got the three lobes, left has got two. And each contain blood vessels, lymphatics, nerves, and alveolar ducts going all the way down to the size of an alveoli and that's where the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide occurs and realize that there is a f f in the tracheal bronchial tree the purposes are filtering humidifying and warming the air before it gets down to the lungs the trachea lies anterior to the esophagus and it divides the right and the left main bronchi at the level of T4 or T5, which is just right below the nipple line on most people at T5. And um, the main bronchi are divided into three branches, the right and the left. And um, as I said before, 
the right bronchi is more likely to have aspiration because it's wider, shorter, and more vertically placed than the left, which is more um, bent horizontally. The branches often begin to subdivide into terminal bronchioles and ultimately into the alveoli where the gas exchanges happen. The bronchial arteries branch from the anterior thoracic cage and um, supplying blood to the lungs and, um, and the bronchial vein is formed in the helium of the lung and most of the blood supply through the bronchial artery is returned by the pulmonary artery. There's a couple of topographic markers. The nipples, they tend to be at T5. The manu um, brium sternum junction, super sternal notch, coastal angles, and the vertebrae um, and the clavicles. We had pictures of those earlier, and they're also in your book. Infants and kids uh, realize that fetal lungs contain no air, gas exchanges through the placenta. And then at birth, lungs adapt to the postnatal function and um, relative decrease in pulmonary pressure leads to the closer, closing of the foramen ovale within minutes after birth. Sometimes it needs a little surgical help, but usually it closes on its own. Um, and there is an increased oxygen tension in the arterial blood, usually stimulates contraction and closure, closure of the ductus arteriosus. Realize the chest of the newborn is generally round. The chest circumference is the same as the head circumference until about two years of age. That's an important thing to remember. Chest circumference is the same as the head circumference until two years of age. With growth, the chest assumes adult proportions and the lateral diameter exceeds the anterior posterior diameter by a two to one ratio. The chest wall is thinner in bony structures, more prominent and yielding than in the adult. <clears throat> so you realize this is a baby under two and you can see the chest AP diameter um, is about equal. Pregnant women, because of the abdomen pushing up on the diaphragm, there's mechanical and biochemical factors leading to changes in the respiratory function. And this is just the enlarged uterus and the, the role of progesterone. There's anatomic changes in the chest and the lower ribs tend to flare out. And the diaphragm um, rises above the usual position and um, and this causes the diaphragm movement to increase so that the major work of breathing is done by the diaphragm. And this is more so the later in the pregnancy. Um, and the minute ventilations increase due to increased tidal volume and the respiratory rate tends to remain unchanged. In the older adult, Barrel chested from loss of muscle strength in the thorax and diaphragm and loss of lung resiliency. There are skeletal changes emphasizing dorsal curve of the thoracic spine. The alveoli is le less elastic, causing fatigue and dyspnea on exertion. And there's a decrease in vital capacity and an increase in residual volume and this decrease in vital capacity, the lungs, as do the kidneys, gradually do wear out um, as you age. And this decrease in vital capacity is how much you can change the oxygen and carbon dioxide. The mucous membranes tend to be drier um, as one ages. So, now we're going to talk about the related history. You want to ask about coughing. What's the nature, the onset, if it's productive or non-productive? What's its pattern? Is it nocturnal? 
coughing or is it um, just sporadic coughing throughout the day. You want to ask about any associated symptoms and any efforts to treat. You also want to ask about medications because a lot of people will cough due to an ACE cough and that cough tends to be just a dry, irritating, <coughs> just one cough at <coughs> every so often, but it's not um, cough like there's any kind of congestion where they cough, cough, cough all in one sequence, you know. <coughs> and the, the ACE cough is just a <coughs> just a one cough and then maybe two or three minutes later it's going to be just one cough again. Um, and it's never productive if it's just ACE cough. Ace cough. Um, you want to talk about the shortness of breath. What started it? What's the pattern? Is there? Is it positional? And you want to find out how many pillows they're having to use to sleep at night. Um, and if there's any, if it's related to any exercise or certain activities of the day, or eating, because one of the patterns of shortness of breath you have to really think of is asthma and asthma is is frequently linked to allergies so that's where your eating gets in there um, also with overeating some people just get so full that um, they're miserable um, you want to try asking if they're trying harder to inhale or exhale because a lot of people won't say it's short of breath but I have to concentrate on my breathing and that in and of itself means you're short of breath and the severity. You also want to ask about the associated symptoms and any efforts that they've used to treat it and that will let you know what's been done and you can alter that um, or modify that. You also want to ask about any kind of chest pain because you can have pleural chest pain, you can have chest pain from just bad bronchitis and bronchial spasms and so you need to find out um, what kind of chest pain it is and what relieves it. So associated symptoms and if they're using any kind of recreational drugs, particularly cocaine. On the past medical history, look at um, thoracic history or surgery, dates of hospitalization for um, pulmonary disorders. You want to talk about the use of oxygen and ventilation to assisting devices like a CPAP or a BiPAP and ask if they've been diagnosed with COPD um, or any other chronic disorders their testing, and if they have an immunization against the Streptococcus pneumoniae and influenza. And that is more important with the, the very elderly, but it's now recommended for all adults The influenza is for everyone now. But um, you need to find out when was their last immunization. Influenza is annually. The pneumonia is every three years, I believe. Um, the family history, ask about tuberculosis, cystic fibrosis, uh, emphysema, any allergies, asthma, or atopic dermatitis, and um, because those all tend to go together, malignancies, um, bronchial, bronchies, bronchial ectasis, um, bronchitis, or any clotting disorders because you're worried about pulmonary emboli. The other thing you want to ask them on drugs is to see if they're on any kind of birth control. Um, for the personal history, you want to find out if they have have um, what kind of employment and if that employment requires long travel. Um, because that's going to increase your pulmonary emboli risk or long, you know, long driving where you're sitting for long periods of time. Uh, ask about the home environment to find out what kind of 
um, heating they have, and if it's um, gas heat, if they've got a carbon monoxide detector, if they use tobacco use or anybody does it within the house, if, if there's any exposure to respiratory infections, um, the nutritional status, because if you're short of breath, you won't be able to eat and talk. You have to do one or the other. And um, so sometimes people just quit eating. Um, so find out if they've got good nutritional status and uh, if they're using any kind of herbs or other remedies. And um, I talked about travel for pulmonary emboli, but sometimes you can have travel because you're going to another area and you have exposures. And um, the Asian flu is an example um, where you'd have exposures to certain things. Uh, what kind of hobbies they have. And one of the hobbies you worry about with respiratory conditions is diesel engines. That tends to stimulate a lot of asthma. Use of alcohol and drugs or any kind of exercise intolerance or tolerance. Either way, if they've got any problems with exercising. Infants and um, children, you're going to look for low birth weight and prematurity because it takes more effort if you've got to breathe to eat, so they don't eat as much. Um, and that's why the, they have a failure to develop along the normal, typical developmental lines for height and weight. Um, and why the low birth weight is because your surfactant in your lungs. So if they're really premature or low birth weight, that might be an issue. Um, you're going to also ask about coughing and sudden onset of short of breath and possible ingestion of kerosene or any kind of antifreeze or household cleaners. If there's any apneic episodes or use of an apnea monitor um, in the children and if there's any kind of swallowing dysfunction and you worry about GERD or a history of um, pneumococcal influenza vaccinations. On the pregnant woman asked about the weeks gestation, presence of multiple fetuses and any other conditions of the uterus that d would displace the diaphragm and um, like too much amniotic fluid. Um, exercise type and energy expenditure and if they're exposed to and the frequency of respiratory infections. On the older adults, ask about the flu and um, the pneumococcal vaccine, weather, ask about immobility and sedentary habits, and if there's any difficulty swallowing, once again for GERD, alter activities because of respirations. And the biggest thing you can do to make a difference in somebody's lung function is really talk about smoking cessation if they smoke. And um, if they do cough, then how often it is and what's the precipitating factors. If there's any dyspnea on exertion or breathlessness, fatigue, weight changes, particularly weight loss. Um, if you add weight, it is harder to breathe because you have more things on the outside of your chest that you've got to move and you have more vessels that you have to oxygenize and ask about fever and night sweats and um, so to find out if you've got pneumonia, the night sweats for TB. Okay, so on the examination, what do you want? You want a pencil um, and um, you can use an eyeliner or you can just use a ballpoint pen, a uh, centimeter ruler and tape, stethoscope with bell and diaphragm, and you can use a smaller diaphragm for children, and then some drapes. And you're going to look at the chest for the shape and symmetry, chest wall movement, 
superficial venous patterns, prominence of ribs, and you're going to look at the AP diameter, sternal protrusion, and any spinal deviations. Now, um, we're going to talk about a couple of chest shapes. And of a healthy adult male, you're going to realize that um, the anterior is broader than the posterior. Um, And now we're going to look at where are some of the lines that you're going to use to um, auscultate the midclavicular line, the right axillary line, and then you're going to have your thoracic um, or midsternal line right here in the middle. On the axillary, you're going to have a medial. Um, our mid axillary and a line, a posterior axillary line, and an anterior axillary line. In the back, you're going to have the vertebral line, and then you're going to have right as where the lungs and the um, scapula meet, you're going to draw a line also, and that's called the scapular line. Um, you actually don't draw these on people, but you kind of visualize them. Peripheral clues that might suggest pulmonary or cardiac difficulties. In the fingers, it can be clubbing. This is a rather late sign. And so, um, and there's early clubbing, and that's to shimmer off. You can look at the breath odor um, and the skin, nails, and lips for any cyanosis or pallor, the lips for any kind of pursing, and the nostrils for some flaring. Look at the respiratory rate pattern quality and count the rate while um, taking the pulse. 12 to 20 is normal. Um, Okay, you're looking for the symmetry. If there's any retractions, you're going to look for retractions between the ribs and above the clavicle, supraclavicular, and at the lowest coastal margins. And a retraction is suggestive of an obstruction to inspiration at any point in the respiratory tract. You can have paradoxic breathing on inspiration and the lower thorax is drawn in and on expiration the opposite occurs. Palpate and you're going to palpate the thoracic muscles and skeleton for pulsations, tenderness, bulges, masses, unusual movements or elasticity of the rib cage and immobility of the sternum and the rigidity of the thoracic spine. How much can it move? How much can it flex and extend? Going to palpate for tactile firmitus, you can use the palmar or ulnar surfaces of the hand and systematically position the hands over the back side of the chest have the person say 99 and normally you're going to feel symmetrical bilateral vibrations if they're decreased or absent this is indicative of some kind of obstruction or transmission of air like in bronchitis or emphysema if it's increased there's a fluid or a solid mass within the lungs um, the thoracic expansion is a loss of symmetry of the movement of the thumbs when you have your two thumbs touching and your fingers wrapping around the ribs and you've got your thumbs right at the diaphragm that there's a loss of symmetry on the movement of both hands. You can, um, you can have tactile fremitus. Um, let me go back to thoracic expansion. Why would that occur? If somebody, for some reason, um, had an injury to one lung 
and it's collapsed, the other side will expand, that one will not. And so it's the hand that doesn't move is where the problem is. Tactile formidus is palpable vibrations of the chest wall that result from speech or other verbalizations. And um, once again, realize the closer you are to the trachea, the more formidus you're going to feel. Percuss over the anterior, lateral, and posterior chest. And you compare the sounds bilaterally. And you're also percuss to do the diaphragmatic excursion. And the diaphragmatic excursion is um, done because you're going to see if the diaphragm is intact. And the diaphragmatic excursion is usually three to five centimeters. And what you're going to do is you're going to first find the diaphragm. And it's going to be around the T10 area on the back. You're only going to do this on the back. And you're going to um, percuss and find the diaphragm, and it's easier to go from hyper-resonant um, to resonant. So you realize that on the back, I'm going to get right back here, um, you're right at the T10 area, and you're going to go from hyper-resonant to, to, it's going to be dull, over the intestines and the thin line in between is your diaphragm. What you want to do is find the, the diaphragm first. Then you want to have the patient take a deep breath and hold it. With a deep breath, the diaphragm is going to go down. And, um, and when the diaphragm goes down, you're going to mark that. Then you're going to have the patient exhale and hold their breath with it all out. That's going to cause your diaphragm to go up. So you want to percuss from resonant to doll again, where the diaphragm is, and you want to measure the difference of how much the diaphragm moves. Realize as you percuss, you're going to have flat over bones, resonant over lungs, Dull over organs like the heart, the liver, the diaphragm, and um, and you know any organ is going to be dull. So what are you listening to? It's a lower pitch. The thicker whatever you're listening to, that's why it's a flat over bone, and air is not very thick, and that's your most resonant. You take a deep breath and hold it, and that's called hyper-resident for how it sounds. And you have a good video clip in your book for how this hyper-resident sounds and how all these uh, breath sounds sound. So resonance is normal. hyper indicates hyperinflation. But if you take a deep breath, that sounds hyper and hold it. That's hyper-resonant. Dullness indicates diminished change, like in pure effusion or lower pneumonia, and it's easiest to hear if you go from resident, or take a deep breath and hold it, making it hyper-resonant to dull. That's a lot easier to hear the change in pitch than going from dull to resonant. So start on the lung tissue and go down. All right, so here's your diaphragmatic um, expansion, I'm sorry, excursion, and um, you're just going down to the T10 area, and you're going to mark the diaphragm, and then you're going to notice the difference, and it's three to five centimeters. Um, on some athletes, it gets up to six centimeters, but that's your normal diaphragmatic excursion. Um, auscultation. Auscultate with the stethoscope provides the important clues to the condition of the lungs. So you're going to listen for intensity, pitch, quality, and duration. And on the right side is somebody that's well, so the bronchi will be coarse and loud. If they're ill, it's going to be low-pitched and may uh, clear with a cough. And that's really true for infants. Um, you're listening to some bronchitis and it sounds terrible. They cough 
get it up and their lungs clear up. A bronchial vesicular is a combination bronchial and vesicular and um, it's normal in some areas. Bronchial vesicular is going to be normal over the bronchial areas. And you've got um, an indication of where you're going to have bronchial and vesicular sounds in your um, in your book. And you need to know the anterior and posterior bronchial vesicular areas and where you're going to have those sounds. So the vesicular are low pitched and the bronchovesicular are over the major bronchi and typically moderate in intensity. And on the back you tend to hear just vesicular. Um, the bronchial is um, going to be highest in pitched over the trachea, like I said. Um, aphomeric, um, I'm sorry, a aphomic um, breath sounds are breath sounds that resemble the noise made by blowing across the mouth of a bottle, and is often heard in a large, relatively stiff-walled pulmonary cavity or a tension pneumothorax with a bronchial pleural fistula. And the cavernous is sounds as is coming from a cavern. It's heard of the pulmonary cavity in which the wall is rigid. Advantageous breath sounds, crackles, also they called them rattles for years, but now they're calling them crackles. They're abnormal breath sounds. They're characterized by discrete, discontinuous sounds. They can be fine, which are high pitched and relatively short, or coarse, low pitched and longer in duration. <laughs> you can also have ronchi, which is um, the wheezes. They're deeper. You want to notice if they're inspiration and expiration. And they're less discreet than crackles. They're caused by the passage of air through an airway obstructed by thick secretions like um, mucus or muscular spasm, new growth, or external pressure. So that's why with the muscle spasms, you would have an expiratory wheeze, and that would be classic symptoms of asthma. Um, you can have a continuous high-pitched wheeze, almost like a whistle, um, heard in inspiration and expiration. And it's a high-velocity airflow, and it can cause um, this can be caused by bronchial spasms, this high-pitched wheeze, and asthma, or it can be acute or chronic bronchitis. A friction rub occurs outside the respiratory tree, and it's the plural pleura around the um, lungs. And it's dry, crackly, grady, and is heard in both inspiration and expiration. And if you will rub your hair right over your ears, that's what a friction rub tends to sound like. Um, just rub your fingers together over your hair, right above your ear. It's caused by inflamed, roughened surfaces rubbing together. You can have a medial stinal crunch, or the humming sign found with the medial um, sternal emphysema has a variety of sounds, loud crackles, clicking and gurgling sounds are synonymous with a uh, heartbeat and not particularly with the respirations. Vocal resonance, a spoken voice and there's a couple of ways to do this. You can do bronchophony, pecto pectoriloquy, or egophony. Now, um, Bronchophony is where you're going to say um, 99 and see if it's muffled. Egophony is where you're going to say E and see if it converts to a muffled ah. Um, and this is this means there's consolidated lung tissue. Vocal resonance uh, diminishes and loses intensity when there's a loss of tissue within the respiratory tree like in the barrel chest of the emphysemic patient. 
Brachophony is greater clarity and increased loudness of spoken words. Um, so when you say E, it should come out E. Um, pectoriloquy is, uh, is where even a whisper can be heard clearly through the stethoscope. So you're going to whisper small words like honey nine. And the egophony is the E becomes Oz. You want to ask about the cough, if it's dry or moist, onset, the frequency of occurrence, regularity, the pitch and loudness, and posterior influences. What do they have to do to be able to cough better and the quality thereof? Sputum, ask about the color, consistency, and if there's any odor to it. Infants. Um, examination approach is similar to that in adults. Percussion is less reliable in infants, and you want to inspect the thoracic cage, noting the size and the shape, and measure the chest circumference, usually two to three centimeters smaller than the head circumference. The respiratory rate varies between 40 and 60 respirations per minute, and there's periodic breathing, a sequence of relatively vigorous respiration efforts followed by apnea as long as 10 to 15 seconds is common in infants. Also, um, coughing is rare, sneezing is frequent, and hiccups are also frequent. At first, breathing is predominantly diaphragmatic and the use of the intercostal muscles is gradual. But then there's gradually, as the have um, paradoxic breathing where the chest wall collapses as the abdomen descends on inspiration is common, particularly during sleep. On infants, you want to palpate the rib cage and the sternum and note, note if there's any loss of symmetry, unusual masses or crepitus, listen to the chest. Breath sounds are easily transmitted from one segment of the oscillatory area to another and there's a localization of breath sounds and an absence of sounds in any given area can be different, I'm sorry, can be difficult to detect. Strider is a high-pitched piercing sound, was often heard during inspirations. It's a result in an obstruction high in the respiratory tree. Respiratory grunting is a mechanism which the infant tries to expel trapped air or fetal lung um, fluid while trying to retain air and increase oxygen levels. It's a cause for concern if persistent and look for a flaring of um, the any kind of flaring and that's another indicator of respiratory distress. Most children don't have flaring of the nostrils. Um, children use the thoracic intercostal musculature for respirations by the age of six or seven. There's a variable respiratory rate decreasing with age and reaching adult rates at about 17 years. The roundness of the chest persists past the second of the year. It's possibly an indication of a pulmonary problem. And the younger the infant or toddler, the more difficult to evaluate wheezing. As the child's chest, um, why it's so difficult to evaluate wheezing is the child's chest is thinner and more resilient than the adult's chest, but with that child's chest being thinner, it's, it's hard to locate it to one area. Um, any kind of wheezing, you hear it everywhere. Um, the breath sounds are more resonant, hyper-resonant is common. It's easy to miss dullness in the kids for like lobal pneumonia. There's bronchovesicular sounds may predominate. Okay, pregnant women um, experience both structural and ventilation changes. Dyspnea is common in pregnancy and is usually a result of normal physiological changes. Overall, the pregnant woman increases her ventilation by breathing more deeply, not more frequently. Older adults, the chest expansion is decreased, the respiratory muscles are weakened, general physical disability, um, they, 
they, the other reason why there's chest expansion decrease is a sedentary lifestyle or a calcification of rib articulations. Bony prominences are marked. There's a kyphosis with a flattening of the lumbar curve and an increased anterior posterior diameter and a hyperresonance is common. So you see the barrel chested of this um, elderly person from the red line is the barrel chested and the other line is what the chest was prior to being barrel chested. Okay, abnormalities. Let's talk about things that are um, serious and not serious. On um, both of these, these are just abnormalities that doesn't have really any pathology. It is the muscular, ch it's the <clears throat> bones of the chest cavity. Now, you can have the pectoris um, carnitum, or, which is A, or the pectoris excavatum, which is B. Now, A wouldn't have as near as many problems because the lungs can inflate fully. The problem with pectoris excavatum is sometimes the more the chest is in, the harder it is to get a deep breath, especially as people age and get kyphotic and um, humpback. And it makes it even harder for the pectoris excavatum to take deep breaths. So they're more prone to atelectasis. But um, the pectoris um, carnidium is, has no real pathology to it. Abnormalities. Asthma. It's a reactive airway disease. Small airways obstruct due to inflammation and hyperresonance um, in the airways. Atelectasis is incomplete expansion of the lungs at birth or the collapse of the lungs at any age. And bronchitis is the inflammation of the large airways. Pleurisy is the inflammation or inflammatory process involving the visceral and the parental pleura, which becomes edematous and fibrinous. You have pleural effusion, which is excessive non purulent fluid in the pleural space. And empyema, which is different than emphysema, empyema is just you've got purulent extradative fluid in the pleural space. So you've got pus in the pleural space. Lung abscess, well-defined, um, circumscribed mass defined by inflammation. Pneumonia is going to be an inflammatory response to the bronchioles and aveola. It can be, the origin can be bacterial, fungal, or viral. Um, influenza, you can have a viral influenza of the lungs. And normally an upper respiratory infection. But due to alterations in the epithelial barrier, the the infected host is more susceptible to secondary bacterial infections. And tuberculosis is a chronic disease that most often begins in the lungs, but then it can spread to many other organs in the body. The abdomen, it, it spreads, and um, but a lot of, most, much of the time, it's in the lungs. The pneumothorax, the presence of the ear or gas in the pleural cavity. You can have a hemothorax as a presence of blood in the pleural cavity. Lung cancer is referred to as bronchiogenetic carcinoma, and it's usually a malignant tumor that evolves from the bronchi epithelial structures. And there's a lot of places where um, it can be a secondary metastasis, the lungs are a common site for that from the brain. Core pulmonale, acute or chronic conditioning involving right-sided heart failure, pulmonary emboli, um, and that's the embolic occlusion of pulmonary arteries. It's a relatively common condition and it's difficult to diagnose. And they call it the great ghost um, because there's a lot of things that can mimic a pulmonary emboli.
But if you cannot figure out why somebody's having chest pain, you have to roll you have to look at pulmonary emboli. The problem with that is that the test for this is a spiral cut CT. You don't really want to base your lab test on a D-dimer because they're nonspecific. Um, but on a lot of shortness of breath protocols for, for blood work, they're going to have a D-dimer and then you're going to have your cardiac enzymes. But um, to really diagnose pulmonary emboli, you're going to have to do a spiral cut CT. Um, and if you do CT of the lungs, and if you write to rule out PE, there are no to do a spiral cut, or you can just say spiral cut CT. Um, one of the things that pre predisposes people to pulmonary emboli that you'll see often is um, birth control pills. And the other one is most of the pulmonary emboli, about 80% of them are coming from the legs. So if they've got any kind of DVT or any kind of emboli in the legs, um, that's where you're going to worry about it. And you can do the ankle, ankle brachial index to find out if that person is more likely to have uh, problems with blood clots coming up from the legs. Okay, on infants and children, there's a respiratory distress syndrome, and it's premature infants have great difficulty breathing, diaphragmatic hernias, and this is um, a result of the imperfectly structured diaphragm occurs in slightly more than um, one in 2,000 live births. And the problem with the diaphragmatic hernia is that things below the diaphragm can get up into that area. Second, um, you have uneven pressure in the diaphragm, so they're prone to hiccups, which is why you're having um, the, you have hiccups because you have unequal pressure in your diaphragm. Cystic fibrosis is an autosomal recessive disorder of the exocrine gland involving the lungs, pancreas, and the sweat glands. It also affects the absorption of things in your gut and um, tends to run in families. These are the babies that when you kiss they taste salty. Okay, epiglottitis. It's an acute life-threatening infection, some, type, some involving the epiglottis and the surrounding tissues. And this is always, this is one that once you um, hear this epiglottitis and this muffy voice or muffled voice, um, you'll know it from there on out when you hear that muffled voice again. But if somebody is drooling, leaning forward, has a muffled voice, and um, with or without fever, Usually, you know, if you get them right at the beginning, they're not going to um, have the fever as much. You have to think of epiglottitis. Now, remember, the epiglottis is what flaps over to have the brachial tree for the trachea or for the esophagus. So, epiglottitis is something real acute, and they need to go to the emergency room. So, if they need to be intubated, they can um, or if they need a crack. Um, croup is this barking, whooping cough that um, has a variety of viral agents and um, parainfluenza viruses. It happens more often in one to one and a half to three year olds of age. And um, they call it a, bar a seal like barking cough. And, um, and so this is one that. It's one just like the epiglottitis. Once you see it, you'll know that barking cough. Okay. Tracheal molacity. Tracheal molacia is a lack of rigidity or the floppiness of the trachea of the airways. Bronchiolitis is the bronchial small airways, inflammation leading to the hyperinflation of the lungs occurring most often in infants younger than six months. 
In older adults, they're more likely to have COPD. This is a group of problems, um, which includes cough, chronic, and often extensive um, sputum production and dyspnea. It's not limited to older adults. Um, and the emphysema, bronchiolitis, and chronic bronchitis are the main conditions that are included in this group. And you have this well outlined in your book. Um, and you can also have um, emphysema, and emphysema is a condition where the lungs lose elactic elacticity and there's a alveolar changes and they remodel. So they lose some of their alveolar walls, allowing permanent remodeling of the alveoli. Um, that's the main characteristic is that it's a permanent remodeling. The bronchio, bronchio um, ectasis and it's a um, condition of chronic dilatation of bronchi or bronchioles is caused by the repeated pulmonary um, infections and the bronchial obstruction. You can have chronic bronchitis, the large airway inflammation, usually a result of chronic irritant exposure, um, like cigarette smoking, um, and more commonly a problem for patients older than 40. So, you can look at the end of your chapter. It talks about the pathology, the subject, subjective data, and objective data. It's important to look at both subjective and objective data for these at the end of the chapter and throughout the chapter. And we will do a demo of this in class. Thank you very much and be sure to listen um, and look at the video clips that come along with your book because they demo these assessments. Thank you.